So I want you to think about the routine that you have before you go to work or before you go to school, basically when you get up in the morning. Maybe you roll out of bed and you have a shower and then you get dressed and you go downstairs and have breakfast and you brush your teeth and then you head out the door to work or to school. Well, before you even get to work or school, you've probably interacted with dozens, if not hundreds or more, of a certain class of compound. I'm talking about the compounds that are found in your shampoos, in your soaps, the polymers or fabrics that are found in your clothing, the carbohydrates and proteins that are found in the eggs that you have for breakfast, or the cereal, or the sugars that you put in your tea or your coffee, or maybe even the sugary alcohols that are in your toothpaste. And if we go a step further, we can even start to think about the compounds that are found in the plastics that make up the bottles that contain the shampoo and the toothpaste and the soaps and the cereals and the milk that you drink. All of these compounds are classified as organic. And there are millions of these compounds with thousands more being found and classified every year. And really, we could spend an entire video series on what we classify as organic chemistry. But in this video, we're just going to take a look at the most basic starting point for organic chemistry, and that is hydrocarbons. Now when we think about organic or hear the term organic, quite often we associate it with uh, healthy living or uh, natural products or living things. And to be honest, until Friedrich Wohler uh, synthesized urea in the lab in 1828, this term was associated with chemistry in a similar way in that organic compounds were believed to only be found in living things. And there are a plethora of different types of organic compounds. But in this video, we're going to focus on one, and that is the simple hydrocarbon. Now, much like bookcase or ice cream or benifer, hydrocarbon is a compound word. It's made up of two other words. And if we think about what those are, hydro and carbon, I think you have a pretty good idea of the two elements that we're talking about. That's right, hydrogen and carbon. So how is it that carbon can give rise to these millions of structures? Well, you see, carbon has a bonding capability far beyond any other element in the universe. It can catenate, meaning it can form long chains. It can form multiple bonds. It can bond with other elements like oxygen and nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur. It can form rings and various other enclosed structures. There's literally almost an endless possibility of the structure that carbon can form. So in this video, our focus is gonna be on the simplest class of hydrocarbons possible, and those are the alkanes. That is, those are those chains that only have single bonds between adjacent carbons in the chain. Now, there's a system that we go about identifying for naming or drawing these structures, and it's based on a root and a suffix system. So the suffix for us is going to indicate the nature of the bonds in between them. The suffix for us is stemming from alkane, it's A-N-E. We have a root that is going to be dependent on the number of carbons that are bonded together in this particular chain. So if we have one, we have the root meth. If we have two carbons that are bonded together, we have eth. If we have three, it's prop, and if we have four, it's bute. Now those four are going to be relatively new to you, so meth, eth, prop, and bute. But you've probably heard those roots before. Think about the methane that might be in the taps in your chemistry laboratory for lighting up your Bunsen burners, or the propane that might be in the tanks that's heating your home or in use of your barbecue, or the butane that you might find in butane lighters. So you see, you've already had access to this at some point in your life, this idea of meth or prop or bute representing something. However, after that, the pent, hex, hept, oct, non, dec would be very similar to those that you would come across when naming uh, inorganic compounds like hydrates or molecular compounds. So we can use those to identify the total number of carbons that we have in that chain. So while we now have an understanding of the naming system for this particular class of compounds, that is, we can use a root, meth, eth, prop, but, and so on to identify the total number of carbons bonded together, and we know that the A-N-E ending, or ane, represents alkanes for only single bonds between the adjacent carbons, how do we go about representing or drawing these structures? Well, you're going to see a couple of different ways that could be used. One is what we classify as an expanded formula. 
And the way that we draw this is we draw out all of the carbons, we draw lines in between each of the carbons to represent the bonds between them, and then we fill them in with hydrogens. Remember, these are hydrocarbons. Now when I say fill them in, keep in mind that each carbon has to have four bonds around it. It has a bonding capacity of four. So if we think about carbon and where it is in that particular chain, the terminal carbons, or the ones at the end, at least for alkanes, are going to require three hydrogens each. The ones that are non-terminal or in the chain, they have a carbon-carbon bond on each side. So they only need two hydrogens in order for them to derive their structure. And if we want to take the formula out of this, that is just the molecular formula, these alkanes have a general formula that we can use, and that formula is CnH2n plus 2. Now that might seem a little bit of a mouthful right now, but if you think about what that n means, that is the number of carbon we have, it can help us figure out the formula by subbing in the number of carbon as n. So for example, if we take a look at something simple like ethane. Ethane has two carbons, so N would represent 2. The formula would be C2. H2 two times 2 plus 2 would give us 6. So we could draw it out and see that there are two carbons bound to 6 hydrogens, 3 for each carbon. Or we can take a look at the CnH2n plus 2 to derive the actual formula of that without having to draw the structure. But this is one structure that we can use. We also have a condensed formula, which doesn't rely on all of the lines between the hydrogens and the carbons, but rather just the bonds between adjacent carbons. And then we have a line formula, which really only represents the carbons by just having lines. And it might look really simple, but what you have to understand is at each point, or each bend in the line, we have a carbon. So at the terminal end, at the end of a line, that represents one carbon. And at each point, before it changes direction again, that represents a carbon as well. So something like propane could be represented like this, where the two terminal ends of the lines represent one carbon each, and the point in the middle represents that third carbon. And quite often, especially when we get into more complex structures, this is the preferred method to use. So hopefully this video very quickly outlined how and why we classify organic compounds as we do. It introduced you to the idea of hydrocarbons and alkanes and how we name them and represent them. In further videos, I'm going to get into how we name and identify branch-chained alkanes. I'm going to talk a little bit about multiple bonds in terms of double and triple bonds between adjacent carbons in the chain. And we're going to take a look a little bit at functional groups and how we can identify those in organic compounds as well. Thanks for watching.